Je voudrais d'emblée dire que notre, notre plaisir d'accueillir euh, Mark Warren euh, aujourd'hui, Mark Warren est le Harold and Dory Merrilies euh, euh, chair de, de, dans la titulaire du Harold and Dory Merrilies euh, chair pour l'étude de la démocratie à l'Université de Colombie-Britannique à euh, Vancouver. Il a, été, il a commencé par publier et écrire sur de la théorie politique presque philosophique, en tout cas sur Nietzsche, puis euh, ses travaux de sciences politiques se sont tournés autour de l'association. Il a publié un, un important ouvrage intitulé « Democracy and Association », puis euh, qui a d'ailleurs euh, reçu un prix euh, important, puis il a coordonné et édité un volume sur « Democracy and Trust », qui a aussi été euh, important. Et enfin, euh, et je dirais peut-être surtout, euh, dans, le cadre de cette, euh, dans le cadre de notre séminaire, il a coordonné et édité le volume intitulé « Designing Deliberative Democracy », publié en 2008 chez Cambridge University Press, et qui est l'étude universitaire de la très célèbre Assemblée des citoyens de Colombie-Britannique chargée de proposer un projet de réforme de loi électorale pour cette province ou cet État euh, canadien. Et comme le disait hier Loïc dans un des euh, panels, c'est cette expérience de Colombie-Britannique est devenue le cas phare de ces panels de citoyens, sur les, on peut appeler euh, en tout cas ces panels délibératifs, euh, donc, euh, Marc est, euh, a coordonné cette étude. Depuis, euh, il a publié un certain nombre d'articles également novateurs sur la conceptualisation de ces panels délibératifs, proposant tout particulièrement, peut-être en discuterons nous aujourd'hui, de les conceptualiser comme des formes de représentation, de représentation sans élection. Enfin, un dernier point dont nous ne parlerons peut-être pas aujourd'hui, Marc a écrit récemment, je crois que c'est sous presse présentement, la première étude académique de l'utilisation des, son des sondages délibératifs en Chine. Euh, c'est un objet de... Euh, voilà, est un, il est inutile d'ailleurs, une fois qu'on a énoncé cette proposition, on a indiqué son intérêt théorique euh, et euh, son côté problématique. Marc, c'est un grand plaisir euh, de t'accueillir aujourd'hui ici. Bon, tu étais là hier, bien sûr, mais tout de même, euh, c'est un plaisir particulier de t'entendre. Merci beaucoup. Well, uh, thank you uh, so much, Bernard, for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you for listening in English. Uh, you wouldn't want to listen to the uh, ten words of French that I have. Uh, but it's really a, a pleasure and on, an honor to be here at this uh, really interesting, productive, um, high-quality uh, conference. Uh, my talk today and the paper uh, from which it's uh, drawn is motivated by an apparent uh, paradox. In the de developed democracies, the public discourse of political corruption remains stubbornly pervasive in spite of the fact that these countries are, comparatively speaking, the cleanest in the world. Uh, in these countries, everyday talk about corruption, uh, I'm going to argue, expresses a politics of suspicion and distrust that reflects a disaffection from politics, corrodes deliberative responses to uh, political conflict, and alarmingly, can be mobilized by populist authoritarians. Uh, I want to make a, a simple argument uh, this morning that the paradoxical strength of corruption discourse in these countries does not reflect corruption in the sense of the abuse of public office for private, private, private purposes, so much as it does, uh, <clears throat> so much as it does, an everyday intuition that the powers of language enable, uh, that enable social cooperation and everyday trust, uh, that this is consistently violated by political speech. Uh, the intuition is expressed negatively in the discourse of corruption. And from this perspective, corruption also highlights the kinds of care that a deliberative democracy must put into protecting the powers of speech, its defining resource, as well as the kinds of trust that enable these powers. I'll conclude by suggesting that we think of deliberative democracy. <clears throat> I don't usually use PowerPoints, so uh, I will um, have to get with the program here. Uh, I'll conclude 
by suggesting that we think of deliberative democratic systems as those that hedge against the corruption of speech. Now let me begin with the paradox. Uh, as measured by Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions, Perceptions Index, the least corrupt countries in the world are mostly the wealthy democracies, with a few interesting uh, exceptions like uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. While corruption certainly exists in these countries, it's exceptional enough so that most citizens don't experience it directly. And when corruption is uncovered, it creates a scandal. Uh, in contrast, in countries like Russia, Paraguay, or Nigeria, corruption is endemic to institutions and it touches the everyday lives of citizens in ways both material and moral. But if you ask Americans, or to a lesser extent, Canadians or Swedes, uh, these are even cleaner countries, uh, whether politics in their country uh, is corrupt, whether politicians are corrupt, the chances are that the answer will be yes. Uh, in the US, which ranks a decent uh, 22nd out of 178 countries or something like that, uh, which could be better, uh, but it's still not bad. Uh, half of Americans believe their politicians are crooked. Charges of corruption regularly appear in the editorials and commentaries of the, the newspapers and the mass media, uh, not simply on the populist fringes, but in the mainstream media, such as the New York Times. Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, declared Congress uh, under the, the Republicans a swamp of corruption. Uh, for their part, Republicans uh, over the last week or so have gleefully latched on to the uh, uh, semi-nude photo uh, incident uh, involving Congressman, Democratic Congressman Anthony Weiner, who has, uh, as of this morning, resigned, or as, as of yesterday, resigned, is evidence that Democrats swim in their own swamp of corruption, uh, whatever that might mean in this case. Now, I don't want to deny that corruption of the standard variety is not a problem in countries like the US, uh, France, and Canada. Uh, it is. Uh, however, I want here to look at a different proposition. Uh, the possibility that everyday, the everyday discourse of corruption is not so much about bribery and influence peddling in the sense measured by Transparency International as it is a kind of popular condemnation of the ways language is often used in politics that is manipulatively and often deceitfully. Uh, in some ways, the framing of this problem has a kind of old-fashioned feel about it. Uh, Thucydides, <clears throat> uh, Thucydides noted that in corrupt Athens, men were so ridden with ambition, envy, greed, and lust for power that they became oblivious to the importunments of justice, honor, mercy, and common laws to which all alike can appeal for salvation should be, they be overtaken by adversity. Uh, used strategically and further individual gains, Words were forced to change their ordinary meaning to such an extent that in today's language we might say that deliberation, public deliberation, was losing its force. Uh, the trouble, of course, uh, is that uh, in Athens, a polity built on the powers of speech, the very medium of speech is losing its reference to right and wrong, to truthfulness and insincerity, to fact and error, and as Thucydides suggests, to the common good. What I'm suggesting is that there's a contemporary version of Thucydides' complaint. Whereas Transparency International focuses on the actionable abuses of public office for private gain, the contemporary discourse of corruption is focused on language use in democratic systems that valorize speech. Corruption in Thucydides' sense has as its object speech in a very particular sense, speech used to refer to facts, norms, and intentions that can and should be the objects of claims in such a way that political conflict can be conducted through speech. So what I'm suggesting is that we ask in a way that uh, corruption professionals do not, uh, what are people saying when they accuse in the general way that they do uh, politicians of lying or dissimulating? What are they implying when they accuse politicians of speaking hypocritically or double-talking? 
Why are promises so important that George Bush Sr. likely lost the 1992 U.S. presidential election over breaking a promise uttered during the campaign of 1988? Uh, it went like this, read my lips, no new taxes. It was a promise that fiscal responsibility uh, required him to break. And why does CNN's Anderson Cooper, uh, for those of you who ever watched CNN in the, U, in the U.S. version, why does he have a whole segment devoted to keeping them honest? Um, so what I'm suggesting here, what I'm doing here is something like a theory experiment uh, by taking these kinds of popular obsessions, if that's what they are, at face value. If we do, I'm suggesting that we're going to find an intuition into the centrality of speech-based commitment in democratic politics generally and in de deliberative democracy in particular. Now, my experiment, of course, as I've already uh, hinted, uh, has a political purpose. It seems to me that the political penalty for misdiagnosing this discourse of corruption is that the norms expressed in this kind of discourse become free for a variety of authoritarian interpretations. When political speech loses its reliability, then it's easy for political entrepreneurs, usually the populist right, to promise to anchor meetings outside of politics, in religion, tradition, honor, or character, short-circuiting commitments that follow from deliberation in favor of those based on extra political authority. Now let me turn to the argument in a little bit more detail, starting with democratic theory. So the basic norm of democracy, at least uh, as I like to state it, is simple and compelling. Those who are affected by collective decisions should be entitled to be included in making those decisions. Democratic systems empower inclusions by distributed entitlements that work, or at least should work, as empowerments for those uh, with legitimate claims to inclusion. Now these include, uh, for example, uh, rights-based based protection from many forms of domination, uh, direct empowerment such as votes, rights to organize, speak pressure, lobby, and so on, as well as indirect empowerments that underwrite citizen capacities such as education, public education, and uh, basic in income support. Deliberative democracy adds a second equally compelling uh, and I, I think also equally simple proposition. Collective decisions are best made through talk rather than through coercion, money-based incentives, or the authority of tradition or persons. Now a related and fundamental claim of deliberative democratic theory is that if talk is doing political work, as it must once other resources of collective decision making are uh, both limited and widely distributed, uh, then the decisions must respond to the powers of speech itself. The relevant powers are deliberative. They involve the offering and receiving of claims in such a way that participants are uh, influenced by the content of claims. Now, these are all basic and widely held ideas within deliberative democratic theory, but less attention has been paid to the kinds of securities people need to invest trust in deliberative approaches to political problems, particularly as compared to the other resources they might deploy, such as coercion, economic inducement, uh, or reliance on traditional authorities. Why would people invest in the apparent uncertainties of deliberation? Now, one kind of answer, uh, this is the kind that we find in, in Rawls and Habermas, focuses uh, on the securities provided by settled law, especially constitutional law, that provide a secure context which serves the double function of prohibiting most kinds of force in political decision making, and as a consequence, displacing conflict onto uh, speaking and voting. Now here I'm interested in a parallel problem, but one that you might say occurs upstream of law and policy within the less settled spaces of the political. Under political, political conditions, language use tends to change from its everyday uses. Politics places a premium on strategic uses of language in such a way that everyday expect, expectations of speech no longer hold, uh, especially the expectation that speech is used in good faith and for the purposes of coordinating common action. Uh, speaking becomes, as it were, a strategic business, uh, sometimes even a warlike business. The point of political engagement uh, is usually, after all, to win. Uh, 
Deliberative democratic theory is by no means oblivious to the hazards of talk under political conditions of political conflict. Many deliberative Democrats uh, emphasize the moral rules that they hold should regulate deliberation. Rawls, for example, uh, speaks uh, well and appropriately of the burdens of ju judgment that citizens should accept, which mostly involve uh, uh, respecting the reasons and reasoning of others. Gutman and Thompson, Ben Habib and others argue that deliberation requires that partisans abide by the principles of reciprocity and respect. Uh, others, uh, including myself, have emphasized the importance of rec recognizing uh, as part of deliberation multiple styles of discourse, good manners, greetings, and other courtesies and recognitions that ease the discomforts of conflict-oriented talk. Now, without denying the appropriateness of these responses, uh, they're all valid, uh, and I accept them all. Uh, there's also a way in which they're too quick. Uh, we need to think a bit more about the burdens under which la language labors within political contexts. And if we do, I think we'll see that it's here within the insecurities that come with conflict that the discourse of corruption gets its traction. The fear is that when people are motivated by partisanship, uh, especially political professionals, they're also motivated to use speech uh, merely to express strategic positions and preferences, and probably also to manipulate, to frame, to distort, to mislead. Uh, what the discourse of corruption suggests is a default position held probably by most people, even in the best democracies, that political speech is corrupt speech, and in particular that the integrity that we associate with everyday talk is most, mostly missing from the domain of political discourse. I want to emphasize that this is, again, not just a, a theoretical concern. Uh, deliberative democracy has to do battle with an everyday cynicism about the place and importance of speech within politics, as well as an abiding suspicion that, in fact, politics is and can only be about interests and powers. So the often repeated charge that deliberative democracy is utopian draws its continuing force from this undercurrent of everyday suspicion of political speech uh, for which uh, there is always sufficient evidence. Now there's yet one final point uh, necessary to frame the question. Uh, the corruption of speech is a particular hazard for, political, for, for deliberative democracy just because it's the form of politics that valorizes language use. The disappointment with language use in a democracy is a sensibility, and perhaps even a moral sensibility, that develops within polities that are learning to accomplish political work through talk. Now, the cynicism about language use in politics has a pretty deep history, and we can find a little bit of this history within the canon of political thought. Uh, it's a history that... Um, uh, actually, finding it within the canon uh, sort of allows this cynicism to... Uh, pass as uh, worldly wisdom, even profound wisdom into the nature of politics. Uh, the cynicism in the canon has two famous origins, uh, one ancient in Plato and the other early modern in Hobbes. Now, I'm not going to go into the interpretations that I offer in the paper, but I want to point out that for both thinkers, the political uses of language are so important and the corrupt uses of language so central to their fears that they both engineer political speech out of their ideal systems with Plato entrusting political discourse only to philosophers, and Hobbes entrusting the business of definition only to the sovereign. Now, these are not uh, novel points about uh, Plato and Hobbes, but uh, what I want to point out, and what I try to point out in the paper, is that there's a tight conceptual relationship that Hobbes and Plato draw between social and political order on the one hand, and the correct use of words in public on the other. The theoretical premises are clear and central. Words should function as cooperative pacts, orienting both speaker and hero, hero toward a common shared moral order. But this pragmatic function of speech becomes corrupted when words merely express the interests and desires of the speaker without regard to their roles in securing order. What's corrupted uh, on this account is the relationship between words and social order. Uh, but, of course, Plato and saw Hobbes uh, sell us uh, way too much. Uh, they resolve the problem of corrupt speech by removing political disagreement and thus political delibera deliberation and putting in its place referential theories of truth 
around which they then imagine political order. Now, this kind of overreaching, again, has contemporary parallels in the populist discourse of corruption, which slides uh, quite easily into a search for non-political anchors for meanings in religion, tradition, order, and character. Uh, Plato and Hobbes prepare the way, conceptually speaking, for these kinds of slippage because they're unable to distinguish disagreement and contest, which is, of course, the essence of deliberative politics, from moral disorder. And yet, uh, Plato and Hobbes were onto something, that theories of deliberative democracy pass by too quickly. And this is the fact that language can generate its own forms of disorder. If we fra fail to frame this problem, then we also fail to frame the question as to why the discourse of political corruption remains so potent. To see how and why the problem remains, we need to restate the problem, I think, not as one of order and disorder as it was for Plato and Hobbes, but as one of self-rule and coercion. <clears throat> what we need what we need to look for are the ways in which the corruption of language can threaten self-rule because it amounts to a kind of coercion. In a deliberative context, the way in which coercion proceeds is through deceit. The problem is not then whether language is secured by reference external to politics, as for Plato and Hobbes, but rather whether language is used in good faith. Cicela Bach, in her discussion of lying, gets this point exactly right when she argues that what is an issue, what is an issue in understanding what a lie is, is not truth, but truthfulness. There is, she argues, a crucial difference between the two domains. The moral domain of, an, of intended truthfulness and deception and the much, much vaster domain of truth and falsity in general. The moral question of whether you are lying or not is not settled by establishing the truth or falsity of what you say. In order to settle this question, we must know whether you intend your statement to mislead. What people depend upon when they regulate their common affairs through language, what they trust is not that people don't make mistakes, uh, which of course they do all the time, but rather that they do not intend to mislead, deceive, or manipulate. Abuses of this kind are highly destructive. The normal expectations of trust, uh, <clears throat> the normal expectations of trust um, that um, <clears throat> can then be used by others to work their will in ways that uh, both depend on the naive of trust of others and upon hiding this will from those who, un <clears throat> who uh, unwill unwittingly fall for this deceit. Sorry, that came out badly. Um, the idea here is that the normal expectations of trust uh, can be very easily used by uh, people who uh, uh, would seek to manipulate or deceive um, uh, <coughs> by, <coughs> excuse me, uh, by using the naivety of those who trust in order to work their deceit. In fact, their deceit depends on, on trust. Uh, again, Bach gets the point exactly right when she notes that deceit involves a kind of coercion. Uh, a deceiver is one who can convert misplaced trust into advantageous power. Uh, deceit and violence, she writes, are the two forms of deliberative assault uh, <clears throat> on human beings. Both can coerce people into acting against their will. Most of the harm that can befall victims through violence can come to them also through deceit. But deceit works more subtly, for it works on belief as well as action. The knowledge of this course of element deception and of our vulnerability to it underlies our sense of the centrality of truthfulness. To the extent that knowledge gives power, to, the, to that extent do lies affect the distribution of power. They add to that of the liar and diminish that of the deceived, thus altering his choices at different levels. Deception uh, can then be coercive. When it succeeds, it gives power to the deceiver, uh, power that all the, those who suffered the consequence of lies uh, would not wish to abdicate. We're now in a position to specify what the corruption of speech involves, at least as a first take. 
Uh, first, we can say that it's a hazard that comes with deliberate democracy. Speakers may be suckered by deception, and those who are sucker, suckered are vulnerable to coercion. Now, it's this possibility, I'm arguing, that keeps the discourse of corruption alive, including its distinctive language of betrayals, distrust, fears of being manip manipulated or suckered, and, and talk of conspiracies. Second, what's corrupted is not the relationship between words and reference that make them true or false, but rather between words and the commitments that are implied by intentions. What's at issue are the social relationships established by words. That's the key point. Words both perform and disclose a social world of, world of actors who are, in principle, solid enough that they can trust one another. Uh, if language has the power to coerce through deceit, this power is parasitic on the more general and essential power of language to generate the social order, a social order built on relations, uh, relationships of, of trust. Now, the key point is that language provides social order, again, not because it references truths external to that order, but because it generates an order as a consequence of what's accomplished through uh, the very acts of language use itself. Social orders based on speech can be corrupted by untrustworthy uses of language. It follows that deliberative democracy must protect this kind of ordering from corruption in this sense, just because it destroys the common resource of what, um, upon which uh, deliberative politics depends. Now, this is the point that I think hasn't been uh, fully and appropriately emphasized by contemporary theorists of deliberative democracy, mostly because they focus on the cognitive work that's accomplished by deliberation in creating, settling, or negotiating moral and factual claims and assertions. But the work is accomplished by deliberation uh, only in part by what is deliberated. Uh, it's also, uh, as I said, about the relationships that are established as a consequence of speaking and listening, relationships that constitute speakers as agents who have the kind of solidity that others can trust. So part of the work that we need to accomplish in deliberative democratic theory is to understand the social construction of trust that is, as it were, the cumulative residue of speech acts. Now, we find some, some help here in, uh, in Habermas, uh, especially his uh, universal pragmatics from the uh, late 1970s uh, in his theory of communicative action in the 1980s, which uh, focused on the pragmatics of language use. Uh, more recently, I started di to digest, uh, mostly with the help of uh, Aben uh, Calvert, one of our smart UBC graduate students, uh, the work of Robert Brandom, uh, an American philosopher of language who, like Habermas, is influenced by pragmatism. Now, like Habermas, Brandom shows that the ability of speakers to convey meaning through statements is intrinsic to the social relations they establish as a consequence of speaking. When social actors make claims, they're able to convey content just insofar as each participant in the conversation can assume that every other participant knows how to continue from the commitments that are implied in the claims or actions. Uh, others then count on the inferences they draw, which are included, uh, which uh, <coughs> uh, includes the inferences includes the inference that uh, the speaker takes responsibility for the claim that he or she makes. Now, over time, uh, commitments form a, a web of uh, inferential relationships in such a way that actors know how to go on from any particular claim uh, by any uh, particular person. Uh, and they can assume, or in the language that I'm using here, they can trust that others will do so likewise. Now, Brandom emphasizes this idea that language leaves a trail of, of dormative commitments uh, among and between people with the uh, evocative image of uh, discursive practice as deontic scorekeeping. When I speak or act, I take on an obligation with respect to you. Uh, when you respond, you take on an obligation with respect to me. So language use is doubly constitutive of, of social relationships and individual agency. On the one hand, knowing how to use language is to know how to go on from the rules, expectations, and norms that are expressed in speech acts. On the other hand, uh, in doing so, speakers take on the normative characteristics of responsible agents, in particular agents uh, responsible for the content of their claims or intentional actions uh, in relation to those that they seek to, to move or to motivate with their claims. Uh, 
sub-random rights. Uh, one way of thinking about claims, claims uh, by which discursive commitments are expressed is in terms of the interaction of inferentially articulated authority and responsibility. In making an assertion, one lends to the asserted content one's authority, licensing others to undertake a corresponding commitment to the use, uh, to use as a premise uh, as a premise in their reasoning, that is, they know how to go on. Thus, one essential, essential aspect of this model of discursive practice is communication, the interpersonal intercontent inheritance of entitlements to commitments. In making an assertion, one also undertakes a responsibility to justify the claim if appropriately challenged and thereby to redeem one's entitlement to the commitment acknowledged by the claiming. Now, in the terms, again, that I'm using here, language use is, in this way, intrinsically linked to trust and trustworthiness of a normatively thick kind. Through communication, each individual becomes an author of claims in such a way that others can infer from these claims agent-like capacities to commit and then to take responsibility for these commitments. Individuals build uh, these fabrics of commitments in such a way that they can move through society with the trust that others are not only non-arbitrary in their, their actions, uh, but that the rules of engagement can in principle be figured out and negotiated through language uh, where necessary and then trusted. Now the connection between this analysis and deliberate democracy is to be found in the work performed by these, these commitments when speakers understand, misunderstand or disagree or uh, in some way come into conflict. Under Brandom's description of language use, speakers can ideally make explicit uh, the uh, ordinarily implicit inferences that underwrite their claims uh, and actions, uh, such that they can reason about uh, the implications and then adjust and resettle. Again, there's trust involved, the trust that a speaker will respond by trying to make explicit their uh, intentions and the inferences that they believe follow and they will adjust, say, to the evidence that their beliefs are incorrect or their normative obligations uh, require new or different actions and, and so on. Uh, so there's trust here, trust that the process of, of making it explicit, to use the title of Brandom's way too big book, uh, will motivate speakers by exposing beliefs and norms in such a way that uh, they will make a difference to commitments. We can now say with a bit more precision what the corruption of language use entails. We know now, of course, that it involves uh, deceit and its variations, uh, lying, dissimulation, pur purposeful omission, evasive language, or language that is intentionally obscure. But when we look at these senses of corruption through the pragmatics of language use, it's now clear that the problem is not that words are coming loose from their reference, again, as argued by uh, uh, Plato and Hobbes and, and sort of uh, common sense, but rather language is corrupted when actors violate for the sake of some kind of gain the inf inferential structure of speech upon which actors depend to regulate social life. Corruption occurs when actors violate the norms that are intrinsic to language use. Uh, when these elements of speech are corrupted, so are the collective goods upon which deliberative democracy depends in particular the rules and norms that give us confidence that political conflict can be creatively and productively managed by talk. So what I'm suggesting then is that there are solid intuitions into the pragmatics of language use uh, buried in the discourse of corruption. Uh, the discourse of corruption remains, remains stubbornly pervasive just because there are real stakes. Deceit, simulation, and the like, when they occur, are radically disruptive of the securities upon which people depend on every, uh, depend on, uh, on, on in everyday life. Uh, not unreasonably, people apply these same standards to politics, especially to the political speech of politicians. So. If this analysis is correct, we can redescribe deliberative democratic systems as those that hedge against the corruption of speech. No system that depends upon language can or regulate speech directly, which would uh, damage the very medium upon which it depends. Uh, but these systems can hedge. Uh, 
uh, by constructing institutions to provide the kinds of incentives and experiences that induce and teach people that they can uh, and should approach political conflict through persuasion, that they can and should rely on language-based commitments uh, that are uh, uh, created out of this persuasion and follow from the persuasion. Uh, now, I want to emphasize that this formulation uh, is not an alternative to contemporary theories of liberative democracy in any way. Uh, rather, it's a, a, a redescription and a kind of amendment for which there are a couple of compelling reasons. Now, the most important reason is that it focuses the question of, of how to protect and enhance the central resource of deliberative democracy, the human capacity to use language to produce trustworthy social environments. When protected, the capacities of language to generate uh, politi the political order, uh, <coughs> to, to generate political order that in turn produces good societies are just enormous. The implicit trust relations that underpin these capacities shouldn't be taken for granted. Uh, they can and often are despoiled and squandered. They're corrupted, much like other commons. Second, we're now keenly aware uh, of non-linguistic threats to deliberative approaches to politics, from differential powers and status to internal exclusions resulting from differences in education and culture. The lens of corruption brings into focus a different kind of threat, an everyday hazard that comes with language use itself, the possibility that individuals will depend on commitments that are enabled by language only to fall victim to deceit. And it's this anxiety, of course, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's the, the key point. It's this anxiety that's exploited by those who use the discourse of corruption to spread cynicism about the mere use of words, right? about the, the pretty speech that's hiding dark and unspoken agendas. Uh, this is a charge that has uh, been uh, used often against uh, Barack Obama. Uh, it's this anxiety that makes the authoritarian responses to the corruption of language compelling to many, uh, the temptation exemplified by Plato and Hobbes, which uh, they, they uh, suck up the temptation of line and sinker, uh, but which can also be found in the appeals of um, any contemporary speaker who points to corruption and offers the security of a trusted person, an imagined national, ethnic, or racial or religious community of like-minded people, or an ideological system, or religion as a kind of guarantee against corruption. So we should think of deliberate democratic systems, to come back to the, the, the hedging point, uh, as hedges against the corruption of speech so that these temptations become less uh, attractive. Um, as a first take, uh, I think we can think about these hedges as working in three areas. Uh, inclusions, uh, representation, and citizen capacities for judgments. Now, my thoughts in these devices are not all original. The original point is connecting them with this idea of hedges against uh, corruption. Um, first, inclusions. Uh, the relationship between inclusion and hedges against linguistic corruption uh, is straightforward and doesn't need too much elaboration. Uh, if language is to do the work of political conflict resolution, Agents should have the resources necessary for inclusion in matters that affect them. So stated negatively, agents should be able to function as veto players if they're not included in, in these decisions. Veto capacities can be distributed uh, as they are in the form of various rights to protect citizens with uh, political legal standing, process requirements, information, and so on. Uh, these kinds of capacities are capacities that have been underwritten by social supports for education, as well as for information and, and, uh, and, and uh, underwritten as well by deliberation which rich public spheres. Now, where these kinds of conditions exist, decision makers should have incentives to include those who might otherwise function as veto players. But in addition, these same veto capacities should provide decision makers with incentives to use language in ways that are trustworthy and credible since the costs of being caught out in the seats will mean that potential veto players will be pushed into opposition, or <laughs> as Anthony Weiner has found, uh, you might be pushed into resigning. In contrast, where language is put to credible use, it can leave a trail of uh, commitments that over time uh, should empower deliberative problem solving. 
Second, theory of representation. Now, most citizens, of course, are not included directly as veto players in the, matter, in, in the matters that affect them. Uh, they're uh, included more indirectly through representatives, uh, including uh, both formal representatives elected or appointed, as well as a variety of informal representatives, such as advocacy groups. Excuse me, advocacy groups. What citizens need from representatives is trust that they say what they mean. Otherwise, citizens have no way to judge the extent to which they're being represented. Now, one nudge toward this type of credibility is pretty straightforward. Uh, citizens cannot know directly uh, whether their, citizens, their, their representatives are speaking credibly, but they can know something about institutional incentives. Uh, <clears throat> these are the kinds of incentives um, uh, created by uh, campaign finance rules, conflict of interest rules, auditing, oversight, uh, and so on. Um, institutions should be designed to blunt uh, uh, corrupt uh, incentives in various ways. <clears throat> and this is kind of common. Uh, uh, these are common tools in, in the corruption business or anti-corruption business. Yet, owing to the strategic necessities of winning and holding office, even with these kinds of checks, elected representatives have a lot of incentives to use language uh, uh, corruptly. Uh, framing issues, seeking rhetorical advantage, choosing campaign phrases that resonate with focus groups are all just part of what you get in a competitive talk-based polity. And we certainly wouldn't want to get rid of these features uh, of a competitive democracy because it would be in the end of democracy itself. But we can imagine mixing uh, forms of representation that have these kinds of incentives with new forms of representation that have other kinds of incentives, uh, in, in particular incentives that aren't strategic in this way. Uh, for example, citizen, what I've called a citizen representatives comprised of bodies such as many publics, like the uh, British Columbia Citizens Assembly. Uh, the members of these assemblies don't face election or re-election, so they're strategic, they have no strategic incentives to, uh, to dissimulate, to manipulate, uh, and so on. So bodies like this uh, could function as new kinds of representatives, one in which the conditions of trust in speech are more robust than they are for elected representatives. The third area, the area of citizen judgment. Uh, None of these sort of institutional design uh, things will make much difference if citizens are uh, removed from the information they need to make judgments about the credibility of their representatives, whether they're elected or their bodies like the, the BC Citizens Assembly. The problem is endemic to the fact that in mass societies, most people of necessity have a mediated relationship to decision makers. Now here too, we should consider the functions of supplementary democratic venues not because they change the mediated character of mass politics, but because they hold out the possibility of altering and perhaps improving citizen attentiveness, as well as citizens' tolerance for the relative messiness of political conflict. From this perspective, the best piece of recent news has uh, been reported by Larry Jacobs and uh, his colleagues in a nice little book called, I believe, Talking Together, who show that the number of deliberative venues in the U.S. has now reached a sufficient density that a, quite a large uh, uh, proportion of citizens have had uh, and continue to have direct experience of political deliberation, and many have experience with deliberative decision making. It's possible, although it's not researched as far as I know, that citizen experience with deliberative decision making, with its requirements for toleration, respect, credibility, persuasion, and attentiveness will cause them to be less attracted to the disaffected discourse of corruption and to operate more like critical citizens who trust when it's warranted but engage and participate where interests conflict, <coughs> conflict and direct first order trust is misplaced. So to wrap up, um, I'm arguing that we can learn something about what deliberative democratic system, about deliberative democratic systems by paying attention to the discourse of corruption. The positive lesson is that the discourse expresses a disappointment with language use uh, that fails the moral tests of everyday talk, but also reveals the powerful expectation that talk-based politics should leave a trustworthy trail of commitments. <laughs>
This tells us once again how powerful speech can be as a political resource, and we're reminded that our job, uh, our job as uh, political theorists, is to continue to imagine institutions that uh, treat credible language use and its cumulative effects as a kind of public good, a public good which, like other public goods, can be squandered, uh, despoiled, and corrupted. Thank you.